Good afternoon, Dr. Calloway. This is Chief Barnes. Hi, and how are you? Good to see you again. It's been a long time since we've got to visit each other. It's been a while, hasn't it? Yeah. yeah. No, In I a non-conference setting. I think it was ethnohistory in Indianapolis, maybe. Probably, yeah. That's right. You keeping safe and sane? Yeah, how about you? About the same, yeah. Doing okay. Well, thanks for, uh, thanks for agreeing to appear for our cultural center. No. I don't want to speak too much. This is Marnie and Natalie's show, so uh, but I wanted to say thank you for uh, being here. Well, thank you. I, I really appreciate the invitation. Glad to see you in the, in the group. Thank you all so much uh, for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, this lecture will be posted via our website here as soon as uh, we do some captioning and, and get it posted. So if you're not able to attend the entire thing or if you know anyone else who wanted to see it, it will be available at shawneeculture.org. I am Marnie Leist. I am the director of the Cultural Center. Uh, we also have Natalie Wadley with us. She is our exhibits and program manager. And we are very, very happy, uh, absolutely delighted to have Dr. Colin Callenway uh, present for us tonight. We're very excited about that. I will go ahead and apologize in advance for any technical difficulties or other difficulties that we may have as the presentation continues, uh, including um, interruptions from cats, dogs, babies, children, spouses, low-flying aircraft, or alien invasion. Um, so we really did try to work out all of our glitches in advance. So Dr. Calloway can get started. I will offer you a brief introduction. His biography is quite impressive and I know many of us um, are familiar with his works. Um, he received his Bachelor of Arts and PhD from the University of Leeds. He has taught colleges at colleges, universities, and schools in the United States and England. He is currently the John Kimball Jr. Professor of History and Professor of Native American Studies at Dartmouth College. He is also currently serving his fifth term as chair of the Native American Studies program. He has numerous publications. Um, including The Indian World of George Washington, The First President, The First Americans, and The Birth of the Nation, which um, has received numerous awards and accolades. I know that many of you have probably read it, and if you haven't, I highly recommend it myself. He has also um, written books such as The Victory with No Name, The Native American Defeat of the First American Army, the Shawnees and the War for America, and the American Revolution in Indian Country, which was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. Um, he has been awarded uh, by the Missaqua Nation of Abenakis and the Native American Students at Dartmouth. Um, he has also been selected for the American Indian History Lifetime Achievement Award and was awarded an honorary doctorate <laughs> by the University of Lucerne. So we are very happy that he agreed to present for us tonight. And I will let you hear his presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marnie. One correction I'm delighted to make. I'm no longer chair of Native American Studies. My colleague, Bruce Dutu has taken over. So that's, that's a, great, a great thing. Um, Thank you all for coming and thank you for this invitation. It's, it's a real honor and a pleasure to be able to talk to you uh, tonight. Um, I suspect that you may well be thinking, what is a British guy <coughs> living in Vermont gonna be able to tell me about Shawnee history? Um, short answer is probably not very much. Um, I have a lot of native students at Dartmouth and I suspect they all ask themselves the same question. Um, about their own, their own communities, their own people. Um, and I think from my perspective, that's okay because it would be a little presumptuous and probably a little silly for me to try and tell them their history. What I think I, I do do is look at American history and 
try and think of ways in which incorporating Native American history into that story changes the way in which we think about the country. Um, a lot of people like me who worked a long time in Native American history have been trying to, as I put it, get Indians into American history in a meaningful way, not just a little sidebar, not just a checking of boxes. And I believe that to do that requires thinking differently about how about American history, but also not necessarily changing the story. Right? Um, sometimes people will say that people like me are trying to turn America, turn history on its head um, to re radically revise American history. I don't think that's necessarily true um, and it doesn't need to be the case. My view is that American history as We've, as we've read it, as we've been taught it, as we've understood it, doesn't actually work, doesn't make much sense without Indian people, without Indian power, without Indian land, without Indian actions, and if you like, agency. And yet, so often American history, as it, as it has been told, um, ignores Native American history. So I think perspective is important and mine's perhaps a little warped perspective, an expatriate European trying to understand American history. And I'm very pleased to be asked to talk about Shawnees in that context because I came to Shawnee history not through any um, cultural centering or any personal experience, but as a graduate student in London working through colonial office records, working through British Indian department records. People often say, you, you really can't do Native American history because they're not there in the records. Well, you should spend several years in the, in the National Archives in, in, in England or in the British Museum, because I kept coming across Shawnees all the time. British officials, British Indian agents were constantly talking about Shawnees. Some of those British Indian agents more or less were Shawnees. They certainly had Shawnee wives and families. And it was a great example of how one group of people can sort of pervade the records and yet simultaneously be talked about very often as if they were not even there. Now what's going on? Okay. And of course, as you're well aware, Shawnee history is a history of movement. And that lends itself, I think, to um, looking at American history as it unfolds. Because many times Indian peoples like the Delawares and the Shawnees, I'm, I'm, I'm currently working on a book on Scotch-Irish invasions of Indian country. Um, Scotch-Irish people are living alongside and fighting Delaware Indians in Pennsylvania, in Ohio, in Missouri. It just keeps uh, going across the continent. So I wanna start with some images and some maps. I'm talking about center of the universe, what does that mean? Well, you look at this picture, this is John Gass's American Progress. And this is the kind of picture you see in textbooks and popular culture all the time. Um, it's fanciful. But it also, I think, reflects popular culture's understanding of how American history happens, if you like. It happens from east to west. It happens when Anglo-Americans move across the country, bringing into this picture you know, the forces of, quote unquote, civilization, telegraph, railroads, farmers, miners, prospectors. And as that happens and light advances across the screen, Indian people exit to the left, accompanied by wolves and bears and buffaloes. Right? It's such a pervasive view of American history that it's, it's part of our popular culture. When I used to live in Wyoming, I was always intrigued watching the weather where people would talk about the weather back east as if we'd all come from there uh, and still on the weather 
people will talk about the weather out west. There's that sense that everything goes in that direction. <clears throat> and this is what I call, you've all seen this. If you took an, an American history class, you've seen something like this. If you teach an American history class, you've seen something like this. It's what I call the tyranny of the textbook map. Right? It lays out how the nation develops. The 13 original colonies win their independence <clears throat> after the revolution. Britain cedes to them all land east of the Mississippi. Then in 1803, the Louisiana Purchase happens. You get that big chunk of white in the middle. Then Texas enters the Union, 1845. And then the war with Mexico brings in most of the Southwest part of California. And it's almost an inevitable lockstep progress across the country, realizing Thomas Jefferson's vision of an ocean to ocean republic. We know it happened, so looking back, it was kind of obvious that it was going to do. Um, I don't think it was obvious to the people who were living there in the 18th century. It didn't necessarily have to work that way. And they had a different view of the country. <clears throat> so this is a, an indigenous map. It's a Catawba map from 1721. And it was <clears throat> drawn when Catawbas and Cherokees and Creeks were in Charleston uh, visiting the governor. And if you look closely at it, you can see in the bottom right hand corner, there's Virginia. It's square. If you look to the left hand side, <clears throat> that's actually Charleston, South Carolina. And you can tell it's a, it's a colonial city because it's, it's grids, it's streets and squares. And at the bottom there, <clears throat> what looks like a, a parachute or an umbrella, it's actually, if you flipped it, it's a boat in the harbor, right? So here's a map of a world that Catawba Indians inhabited in 1721. And so the colonial powers and colonial places are part of that world. They were in Charleston when they did the map. But their view of the world is a world of circles <clears throat> in which Indian nations are central and they are connected one to another by paths of peace. Right? They trade with one another. It's not a map that would get you where you wanted to go if you were following it like a <clears throat> uh, GIS or a Rand McNally, but it's a map of social and political realities. And so what I'd like to do is something like this. Right? And you probably can't see it very well, but you probably get the idea. And that is <clears throat> that any time we're looking at a people's history, I don't care whether it's Highland Scots or, or Shawnees, you don't try and reconstruct their story, their history from the, ed by, from the edge of somebody else's frontier in the way that native peoples have often been depicted here. People live, I believe, at the center of their own universe. Right? The world revolves around them. Certainly that's how we think of things at Dartmouth, right? Um, I think everybody else does, right? <clears throat> and so if we think of Indian nations as nations, they sit at the center of a world in which they are connected, as in that Catawba map, to other nations and to colonial powers, and they're at the center. And so rather than existing on the edge of a steadily moving westward frontier with a line separated, dividing Indians and whites. I think it's more profitable, more productive to think of Native American history and Native nations as existing at the center of their own world and dealing with a host of other nations, some indigenous, some European and Rather than it being the spokes of a wheel, as I've suggested here, or if it is the spokes of a wheel, as I suggest here, the, the wheel's moving, right? Because nations, whether they're Indian or European, have foreign policies. And those foreign policies in relation to one group will change depending upon relations with another group. And sometimes 
upon relations between other groups that affect you. Okay? And I think that you could adopt this and apply this to any and every indigenous nation on the continent. And that would give you a very different depiction image of not only would it center <clears throat> indigenous peoples in their own story, but I think it, it, it gives a different view of this continent and how things were on this continent and how things unfolded. And I always find, I find looking at the history of Shawnee people, Delaware people, numerous other peoples. If, you, if, I, if I do it that way, it helps me to understand the history of the continent where I live too, in a different way than if I pick up a standard United States history textbook. And Shawnee people, of course, were famous as one uh, trader agent described them as the greatest travelers in America. So unlike maps of Native America that show Indian people kind of frozen in time in one place, or as sometimes happens, they put them where they are now, even if they were nowhere near there in 1500. Shawnee people are people on the move. They exit the Ohio Valley homelands in the course of the 17th century, moving west, east of Pennsylvania, south to Georgia and the Carolinas. And when and they do that, they are meeting other Indian peoples and they are also meeting Europeans. They are moving, as they, if they move southwest, they're moving towards Charleston. They're moving towards <clears throat> those English colonists who are triggering not just the deerskin trade, but also a slave trade that reaches all the way to the Mississippi Valley. And Shawnees and other Indian people who are on the move, those moves propelled by the forces of uh, colonial <coughs> uh, invasion, uh, are also participants in all of those changes. And then by the first half of the 18th century, they're on the move again in a sense though, coming home, returning to the Ohio Valley at a time when the Ohio Valley itself is becoming central in a war between, or a contest, not just between England and France for North American hegemony, but also between different colonies, Virginia and Pennsylvania, and also between <clears throat> or among different uh, native nations as the Iroquois League tries to assert its dominance over the area and people like the Shawnees and the Delawares um, reassert their own independence. Tracking those movements and or at least just being aware of all of the different groups that are involved in those sort of stories gives a much more complicated picture than one we can get by looking at either the American history textbook maps or a map like this, <clears throat> which is a, a British map. And um, compare that with the Catawba map. Right? This is a very different way of looking at the continent and looking at land. Right? It's just divided up by straight lines. British people have been doing this all over the world for ages just draw borders everywhere, create havoc and leave and let people sort, sort things out. But you look at this map, which is actually more interesting than it appears because it does include in the small print names of Native American nations. The first thing you get is a sense of a map and a continent that's been surveyed and measured and bordered and divided up, right? <clears throat> And that's, of course, um, creates the conditions for those kind of contests that we're, we're talking about. It helps to understand why Virginia was reaching into the Ohio Valley because Virginia had a colonial charter which gave it so much land that it had 
land claims, not just to the Ohio country, not just to the um, Mississippi, but to the Western Sea. Nobody knew where the Western Sea was, but they, they claimed it. So we've got very different views and understandings of this continent at work. And our histories are dominated, of course, by conflict, by the conflict for that. Indian history is told very often as a, a story of, simple story of conflict and defeat, accommodation, resistance, et cetera. And certainly that's a huge part of it. And certainly the Shawnees are, always seem to be at the forefront of that. And the Shawnees tell the British during the revolution, we always seem to be the frontier, right? Wherever we are, we seem to be fighting for our lands and for our independence. But again, that's a, an agenda, if you like, that we get if we simply say, okay, who are these people? Where are these people? They're at the center of their own universe. So they're not gonna be fighting as pawns of the French. They're not gonna be fighting for somebody else's agenda. They're doing their own thing. What are they doing? what any human beings would be doing. They would be looking out for their families, for their lands, for their way of life. With multiple tactics and strategies. This is a modern representation by an artist called Robert Griffith, who does a thing called Eastern Frontier Art. But I include it to suggest that on that map that we just looked at, if we were able to zero in at a this was 1755 at a time when the continent's exploding in the French and Indian War. We would be just as likely, perhaps more likely, to meet a guy who looked like this than an Indian warrior with a hatchet, with a tomahawk, going to war. Somebody like this who is a, an intermediary, a diplomat, somebody who's following those white paths of peace, carrying a calumet pipe and the wampum belt as vital uh, tools for conducting diplomacy, for conducting foreign policies, for negotiating alliances, because to go to war you needed allies, and to end wars you needed to negotiate peace. These are all of the attributes of a nation's foreign policy. And so here's the Secretary of State for, in this case, probably, I think, a Delaware nation. But that's a part of that pivotal part of American history that I think is lost. And when the Shawnees appear in that, what are they doing? Well, they're, kept, they're kidnapping Daniel Boone's daughter, right? There she is looking like a Madonna. Um, famous story of uh, Indian cap, Indians taking defenseless white women captive, Daniel Boone recapturing them, et cetera, et cetera. That's part of the folklore of America. Um, but the flip side of that, of course, is why were they doing that? And what was going on and how did this appear uh, from the other side of the coin? Well, at the end of the French and Indian Wars and the end of the Pontiac's War, as it's called, which occurred immediately afterwards. The British army led by actually a, a Swiss officer, Henry Bouquet, um, negotiated peace terms with the Shawnees and Delawares. And as they did after every conflict, they included in those peace terms, a clause that said, you have to return the men, women and children whom you've taken captive because that was an important part of Native American warfare in the Eastern Woodlands in the 18th century. Hundreds of people were taken captive. From the area where I am right now, um, Northern New England, it's estimated that as many as 1600 people were taken captive by Indians, many of them from Canada. And of those people, some, remain, some returned, some died, some disappeared, but some lived out their lives with Indian people and as Indian people. 
they were adopted into societies, into communities. And when that happened, became fully functioning members of those societies, if you like. And there's lots of, I've done a lot of work on captivity experiences in people in this area of the country. And there are people who, who come back and maintain the ties with their in adoptive native families, even as they return to their home families. In 1764, in, in, in keeping with the terms of the treaty that had been negotiated, the Shawnees and Delawares brought their captives to the British camp. From the British point of view, these people were being liberated. Right? But that's not exactly what happened. This etching conveys or matches a description of what was going on by somebody who was there, who was actually William Smith, um, who was not someone who was, uh, shall we say, fond of Indians. Right? He had his own prejudices and attitudes. But he said, when the Indians attempted to deliver their captives, to hand them over, the captives fought against it, struggled. Children, well, you can see here, they're pretty hefty looking children, but you can see that it's, they're recoiling from this. They're clinging to their adoptive Indian Shawnee Delaware parents and families. And the commentator said, well, that we can understand because little kids would very quickly become accustomed to living as and with Native Americans. He said, the troubling thing is that grown-ups, grown women, and even men, if they, there were fewer men, would resist their liberation. And they had to be actually guarded, they had to be bound to stop them from escaping and running away and going back to live as Indians. This was a phenomenon that was so prevalent, so common in colonial America, and I, later, that even Benjamin Franklin commented on it. He said, we make all these efforts to convert Indian people into living like us, and they're not interested, but hundreds of white people voluntarily go and live as Indians, or if they've been taken captive, prefer to live as Indians than return home. That's something that I think is important to consider when we still see in American history books, narratives that even though they may not use the terms civilization and savagery, are still couched in that kind of narrative that a superior way of life or a stronger way of life is displacing a weaker, more primitive way of life. People who had this experience and who resisted that liberation didn't share those views. There was, as John uh, Hector St. John Kerfker John said, something in the social bond of these native communities that's more appealing and more captivating than in our own. That's the kind of thing I think it's important for students to, to think about, non-native students in particular, um, who may come to American history with, their, with a set of assumptions. At the end of the American Revolution, Great Britain, without consulting its Indian allies, transfers to the United States all its land south of the Great Lakes, north of Florida, east of Mississippi. And then the question becomes, how does the United States gain access to that land? Because the United States is broke. It's won its independence, it's won a lot of territory, but it's trying to build a nation. And frankly, it's got nothing except the land that Britain has transferred to it. And that's Indian land. So right from the inception, the United States is a nation that is built on Indian land. And how is it going to do that? Well, you can see that in 1787, it creates the Northwest Territory. And the Northwest Territory and the ordinance that went with it basically set up a blueprint for expansion across the continent. It essentially said territories 
will only remain territories until they reach a certain population, 60,000. And then they can enter the United States as states on an equal footing with all the other states. And that's how most states have come into the United States. But that meant that that, that pink area, north and west of the Ohio River, becomes the test ground, testing ground for American Indian policy. The Northwest Ordinance says, we're gonna set up these procedures for territories to become states. It's a blueprint for national expansion. But it also says, we will deal fairly and honorably with Indian people and never invade their lands except in just and lawful wars authorized by Congress. Well, I'm not sure you can have it both ways. We're gonna take their land, but we're gonna deal with them fairly and honorably. But again, you look at the map, you look at the Ohio River, slap bang, Shawnee homeland. Shawnees are right on the cutting edge of the conflict to defend the Ohio River against American expansion. And that is one of the epic, I think, conflicts in American history. It's hugely important because the United States at this time is an infant. It's only recently won its independence. Only in 1789 does it adopt the constitution. It is not the power that we come to know. It's a fragile, precarious confederation of states, not all of whom are sure that they wanna be in the United States, not of all, all of whom are willing to delegate power and authority and land to the United States. And this young nation confronts an Indian power that is formidable. So often I think our histories talk about the Indian wars in which their defeat is a foregone conclusion. Right? That's because we're blinded by 2020 hindsight. In 1791, George Washington dispatched an American army into Northwestern Ohio to um, defeat the Indian resistance movement. Because what was happening in Ohio, in that area of Northwest Territory, was that Indian nations were doing exactly the same thing as the American states. They were confederating. They were uniting to resist the common threat posed by the new American states. And the key players in that movement were Miami Indians, Delaware Indians, and Shawnee Indians. Um, and those three key nations, plus a galaxy of other leaders and, uh, and groups, forged a confederation that not only met and resisted the American invasion, but defeated it. In November 4th, 1791, the indigenous army led by Blue Jacket, Little Turtle, Wakonga Helis of the Delawares, not only destroyed the army led by Arthur Sinclair, they obliterated it. The problem for the United States was that that was the only army that it had. Thomas Jefferson said, when the news of that reached Philadelphia, nobody talked about anything else. Now, as, um, Marnie mentioned, I, I wrote a little book about this battle. And the reason I did that was because I couldn't quite understand why hundreds of other people hadn't written a book about this battle. Because hundreds of other people have written about the Battle of the Little Bighorn and killing Custer and all of that. This was far more dramatic, far more significant. But this didn't even have a name. It's always referred to as St. Clair's defeat, not Blue Jacket's victory, but St. Clair's defeat. Um, and efforts to understand it very often have focused on, well, what did he do wrong to allow this to happen in the same way that people have often looked at the Battle of Little Bighorn and say, well, what happened? 
I remember being at Little Big Horn for a conference and with people who kind of walked over the battlefield using stopwatches to try and figure out what had gone wrong. I think for Lakota people, it was quite simple. Sitting Bull had had a vision in which soldiers fell into camp without ears. This was sort of preordained. <clears throat> and that refusal to recognize what's going on on the other side, if you like, still, I think, um, plagues our histories and limits our understanding of what was going on. This wasn't a battle that St. Clair clumsily lost. This was a victory that was achieved as a result of Native American diplomat, uh, diplomacy and statecraft, organizing uh, and, and uniting a confederacy of Native American battle tactics and of Native American people fighting to defend their homelands against outside aggression. I don't think there's anything complicated in that, but we often don't go that way. <clears throat> so if you've, in my, my book on George Washington, I, I talk some about this. Um, when Washington's in his first term as president has a lot of visits from Indian delegations, including in 1796, um, a delegation from um, chiefs of the tribes who had fought against the Americans and then after the Battle of Fallen Timbers had made peace at the Treaty of Greenville and basically said we will go to Philadelphia and see the president as nations do and Washington was constantly receiving Indian delegations including the one that the Shawnee chief Blue Jacket and Painted Pole or Red Pole um, and they, like those Catawbas I mentioned in Charleston, they're in town. They get a tour of the town because George Washington knew what we don't know or what many, many of us in American history have neglected. And that was that Indian power still mattered. Even though the Northwestern Confederacy had been defeated, Indian nations were still powers to be reckoned with in this land. And the United States, as it tried to make its place in the world among the nations, among the powers of the earth, uh, as they said at the time, those nations included not just the nations in Europe, but also the nations on the American continent. Those were native nations. Of course, in American history, then the narrative picks up again. American expansion keeps going. Enter Tecumseh, right? And the Shawnees have the um, the credit of having one of the few Native people who figures in standard treatments of American history, and with good reason. Tecumseh was a remarkable man by any standards. And what he's doing, of course, is <clears throat> reprising and re re um, reviving that united resistance, united war of independence, if you like, that earlier native leaders like, like Blue Jacket had fought. Tecumseh in American history, of course, is a figure that um, often is used as a closure because with the death and defeat of Tecumseh, then effectively Indian resistance east of the Mississippi ends and still in too many his American history books, Indian history east of the Missi Mississippi seems to end. But let's return to, to this map because I want to suggest ways in which we continue to look at that to complicate this by inserting or imposing native peoples. And when you look at that map, one of the things that's glaringly obvious is that it, it has the names of states that in many cases don't yet exist, but there's not a single native nation there. So the message of this map is that American nation building and the, the story of the development of this country is something that happens in the absence of Indian people and Indian nations. And that gives a, 
a distortion of not only the stories of the people who were ignored, but I think the larger story that, that we're all concerned about. And so often when in a, explaining larger forces, what we do is latch on to founding fathers. Right? So we we'll look at well, people like me write books on George Washington, or we look at the Louisiana Purchase and think of Thomas Jefferson. And what I always like to do is say, the Louis Louisiana Purchase happened not because of Thomas Jefferson, but because of this guy. This is the uh, it's Idis Egypti. It's the mosquito that carries yellow fever. What's he got to do with it? Well, France had formerly owned, claimed all of that white territory. Right? When it lost its North American empire to Britain in 1763, it gave its lands east of the Mississippi to Britain, lands west of the Mississippi to Spain to keep it out of the hands of the British. Spain um, subsequently ceded the land to France, to Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon Bonaparte, being a megalomaniac, had a vision of restoring France's North American empire. To do that would require sending troops. But before he could send troops to mainland North America, he had to deal with something that was happening in San Domingue, which is what we call Haiti which we're used to thinking of as one of the poorest countries in the Western Hemisphere. But in the 18th century, it was one of the jewels in the colonial crown because of course it was France's sugar island and it was a slave society. And it exploded in the wake of the French Revolution producing, I believe the only successful slave rebellion in history and producing in roughly the same era as the American Revolution produced the American Republic, a black republic in the Atlantic world. Napoleon had to get a handle on that before he could do anything serious in North America. And so he dispatched his armies to Haiti where they promptly died because of disease, because of yellow fever. Napoleon washed his hand of the whole enterprise, decided to go off and invade Russia and things, right? Which meant that when Thomas Jefferson sent ministers to Paris to buy New Orleans, because Je as Jefferson said, whoever controls New Orleans controls the destiny of the, our nation. The French offered him the whole lot. It's a coup for Jefferson, but I don't think it would have happened without the decimation of French troops through malaria and yellow fever. It's an invisible presence that we don't see in that map. And the same thing very often applies in lots of places as you slice the map, you could look and say, who's not on that map and what impact did they have? And I think if we <clears throat> reimpose all the people who are missing, including now Shawnees in a different location, and other peoples in different locations. That simple story that that map tells can no longer be simple. And if we dig deep, we get a slightly different story. And I'll finish with this example where I'll draw shamelessly on other people's work that they've done that I haven't. In looking at <clears throat> the Comanches in the Southern Plains in the late 18th, early 19th century. The Comanches built an indigenous power base on the Southern Plains based on horses, buffalo hunting, trading, herding, and raiding into Mexico. That was part of the economy. They were not alone. Utes, Navajos, Kiowas, other people were doing that. But this meant that the Comanches, for the a good 50, 60 years were the major power in that area of the continent. Not the major indigenous power, 
the major power. They rolled back <coughs> Spanish frontier. And then after Mexico secured independence, were a constant presence and a constant threat on the northern edges of Mexico's um, borders. In 1846, as we all know, the United States went to war with Mexico, disputes over Texas, etc. And the map that we looked at would simply say, yes, the United States won, Mexico lost, which incidentally often fuels some enduring stereotypes about <clears throat> Mexican people. I've, I've read those in students' essays. Part of the reason Texas was won its independence was because Mexico invited and attracted American settlers into Texas to act as a buffer against Comanches and other Northern Indians. And when the war with Mexico broke out and American armies advanced into Mexico, one of the key reasons why they were able to win the victories that they won <clears throat> as quickly as they did because it was because Mexican military capacity had been incrementally eroded over years and years of waging a defensive war against the Comanches and other Indian people. That gives us a different understanding of a fundamental and major development in American history by which the United States increases its territorial domain immensely. But if we don't impose Indian nations on this map, what we get is a very shallow understanding of what was happening. <clears throat> and I think that anywhere across the continent, those stories, whether they're Shawnee story, the Shawnee stories or the Comanche stories, are hidden or obscured by a map like that. And what we need to be doing is reinscribing them in that map to better, of course, <clears throat> relate the stories of those people themselves, but also to better understand how things happened that the way they did and how things developed in this country and how things came to be the way that they are. And as you can see, this is something that um, it's not just, a, if you like, a Shawnee project. It's, it's a, a way of looking at, um, at the history of the continent. But as a European, I always felt that um, the distinctive thing about <clears throat> American history was the presence of Indian people. But as a historian, certainly growing up and as a, a, as a young guy, reading American history, the thing that always bemused me was the absence of Indian history or the short changing of Indian history. And so <clears throat> the work that people like me are doing is not revisionist history. It's not trying to um, devalue or somehow discredit uh, American history. It's really to get a, a fuller understanding of it in ways that recognize the significant roles <clears throat> of Indian people and that for long time, Indian power and Indian presence was very real and exerted uh, significant impacts on events as they unfolded. Thank you. I've gone a little long, but I find it hard not to. Thanks very much for listening. And I'm happy to have questions. I will stop that. So you can type any questions you have for Dr. Calloway into the chat box. And um, Natalie Wadley, I think, has been keeping track of a few. And I will let her read those off. Yep. Um, can everybody hear me? I hope. Um, so Renee Goki, um, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, asked, is there a reason the British were not represented in the circle and spokes? 
And if the defeat <laughs> of St. Clair was so consequential, significant, do you have ideas why someone like Tecumseh gets covered in U.S. history and not Blue Jacket? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good question. Since I, I, I did the spokes and the, um, you, you're talking about the chart that I did? Well, I believe so. Yeah, well, that's my fault, probably being British. It's, but either I'm being modest or it's just the assumption, well, of course the British are there. Um, as, for, as for Tecumseh, of course, Tecumseh's such an interesting guy and such a compelling character. And there's a new <clears throat> a book just out by Peter Cousins on Tecumseh and the Prophet, and there've been several. Um, Dave Edmonds, who's a, a, a scholar friend of mine, <laughs> sort of argued that, you know, um, Tecumseh is so compelling, because Tecumseh is so compelling, um, he, he, he fits right, um, that in an American history where we're looking for, for heroes, right, he fits as a hero. As, as a hero. Um, but of course, he, he fights against American expansion and he dies. So in some ways, it fits that old story of um, noble resistance, but tragic defeat. And of course, that's, um, there's a place for native leaders in that category, Chief Joseph, et cetera. That may be part of it. Um, and I don't mean to say that Tecumseh doesn't merit the attention that he's gotten, of course he does. What baffles me is that somebody like Blue Jacket, there is a great biography, of, a, a large biography of Blue Jacket by uh, another Brit, John Sugden. But these were key players in their time. Right? That's why you know, George Washington had them over for dinner. I don't believe he liked, enjoyed having Indians over for dinner just for the sake of it. But when Blue Jacket was in town, this was someone that you had to pay attention to. So Blue Jacket got the tour of Philadelphia that you talked about. In fact, um, he's a, the part of the tour was to visit Peel's Museum. And when they're in Peel's Museum, they turn a corner and they come face to face with another Indian delegation of Creeks and Choctaws and, and Chickasaws who were also in town getting, uh, getting the attention. This is a time when in American history, Indian people mattered and they were still in a sense everywhere. You could expect to see them on the streets of Philadelphia. Um, in fact, I've just finished a little book about Indians visiting early American cities. Um, and Renee, that wasn't a good answer to your question, but it got, got me off on a, on a, on a side note. Um, but I think the question is an important one, not just for this, but when we look at history, what are the, what are the stories that are told and what are the stories that don't get told and who gets to decide whose stories get told? Because, and I, and I think that's fundamental in, in getting our hands and our heads around American history. Okay, um, we have a couple of questions by Angela Helmig. Um, her first question was, can you speak more to the Preordain idea with St. Clair? Um, Preordained. Natalie and I were talking earlier about how when I give talks and teach, I don't have notes. Actually, it's, sometimes it might be a good idea to have notes to know what I said. Um, and I'm trying to think in ways in which uh, I, I, I suggested that, oh, I, 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 talking about Sitting Bull's defeat, yeah. So when um, Rida Mali, who's a Lakota historian, a, a scholar of Lakota history, <clears throat> talks about how in, um, in Lakota history, we need to understand that this was not a victory won by maybe tactics and firepower, but which of course part of it, but rather had an important spiritual element to it. Right? So the Indian people knew they were gonna win. I think applying that to Sinclair's defeat, there's an account 
from Thomas Ash, I think it is, who is a, a white guy. He's captive with the Shawnees and is with the Indian army. And as Sinclair's army is floundering its way across the um, Ohio wilderness, the Indian army is marching towards it and they're singing. They, and they are, they go through the rituals of preparation of fasting and praying and doing all of the appropriate uh, things that warriors did in preparation for the violence of conduct, of conflict. Right? We're accustomed to being told that Indians were natural warriors. They just did this naturally. I think from looking at 18th century native history, Indian people regarded war as an unnatural state of affairs, which you had to prepare, prepare for ritually. So when I see those two armies clash, not only are the Indian warriors and the Indian army better prepared to engage in combat, I think they are better prepared spiritually for what's about to happen. And I think those are elements, those are elements of course that I, I can only get a sense of and only maybe glimpse at and you know, really have no business, you know, no expertise or you know, knowledge to talk about. But I think it's there even in the, in the historical records, right? That there's different attitudes and concepts about what's happening here. Two side, two groups of men involved in the same actions but maybe with different understandings of what was going on. And I think from the Native American side with the certainty of, of victory. I mute myself. Um, her next question was, um, how has not having a representation of Native communities land on the maps in the early years affected us now and how people look at Native communities today? Mm. Yeah, that's, that's a hugely important question, of course, right? And one of the reasons that I'm interested in maps is because maps are also, um, a lot of historians, I think we use maps almost as decoration. Well, the book needs a map, find a map to put it in. <laughs> but maps are, are more than decorations, they're more than il illustrations, and maps are historical documents, right? And so like any historical document, they were produced for a purpose. And the purpose, like other historical document, is not to inform us accurately about what was going on. Very often maps were produced with an agenda to establish claims like that John Mitchell map that we, showed, we saw with all those lines. Right? And if you create a map that in that stamps your name all over it, Virginia, right? That establishes right there a visible claim. If you create a map that erases people's names, that does the opposite. A British cartographer by the name of uh, Brian Harley, who's um, now dead, um, wrote about what he called the victims of a map. And he was not talking just about North America, he was talking about places like Palestine, et cetera, et cetera. How with almost the scratch of a pen by creating a map that does not include people, you can erase their presence. And you know, I, I, here in this area of the country, when I testified for the Abenakis in the fishing rights case, years and years ago, one of the things that the state's attorney general pulled out and, put in front of me were maps, right? Basically using maps that had, that did not show the presence of Abenaki people to suggest that the reason they didn't show the presence of Abenaki people was because there were no Abenaki people there, right? Well, that's not the same thing, right? This map may have been produced for the very purpose of not showing Abenaki people there, and establishing claims to the land that they are not on. So I think when we look at the history of this continent, which is of course, this, this, I think one of the central stories of this continent, 
this country is the transformation of Native American homelands into American real estate, then maps are fundamental, not only for, in a sense, charting the development of that story, but also to look at them as instruments in how that dispossession and transference of land took place. Um, so I, I, I think it's a, it's a great question and one uh, that um, everybody should be thinking, you know, it should be a fundamental part of, of, of American history. You know, what are maps about and what, what do those, what stories do those maps tell and not tell? And who's making the maps? Thank you. Um, so Coral Avery asks, uh, our um, she says that you mentioned the history of Anglo-Americans wanting to remain in indigenous communities slash life ways, but how do you see that having an impact on the way colonized history has been written? The history textbooks of my middle school wrote Blue Jacket as a white man that joined the tribe rather than mm -hmm. a tribal leader of Shawnee heritage. So I'm interested, I'm interested to hear your thoughts. Yeah, yeah, that's something that I think is generally um, not accepted. Um, but he could have been because white people did become members of native tribes <clears throat> and to all intent and became Indians. Right? Um, the Blue Jacket, the story of Blue Jacket as being a white man, I, I suspect goes back to that notion <clears throat> that if an Indian leader is going to be doing something significant or impressive, then he must have some white blood or connection there, right? So after the Battle of the Little Bighorn, how could Sitting Bull have defeated Custer? Well, you got all these stories about Sitting Bull. Well, he didn't he attend West Point and you know things like that. Um, so I think a lot of those those stories come out of frontier tales and folklore. And yet, <clears throat> while I, I don't agree with that, I think that mingling of peoples is significant and pervasive, right? Um, because in that history of, so front, frontier is not a straight line, right? It's not a border, it's not a, a wall separating Indian white people. These frontier areas are zones of contact. So in any Native American village, I think, you're going to find people of other tribes, other ethnicities, and increasingly, people who are white. They may be missionaries, they may be traders, they may be in Indian agents, like Alexander McKee or Matthew Elliott, who were British Indian agents living in Shawnee country. <clears throat> and some of them will be white people who have made the transformation to an Indian way of life. It's a very, it's a much more complicated and dynamic uh, situation. The reason that I, I wanted to bring it up was because I think for those of us who teach, um, it's something that I found when you bring it up, students kind of get it. They think, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. This isn't how we've been taught or accustomed to thinking of Native American society, which wasn't it, wasn't it backward? Wasn't it primitive? Wasn't it the case that all, all of the good things that were to be had were brought by your, Europeans and Americans. Wasn't this what the whole United States civilization program was about? But I think you don't have to look far into these to find that there's, there, those absolutes don't work. Right? And that there are people uh, and experiences that point to the values and the benefits and the attractions of um, Native American society. So I was just proofreading something I'd written today where um, the governor of Pennsylvania 
is talking to Iroquois people who've been to Philadelphia, I think this is 1792. <clears throat> and he says to them, I know that visitors to your communities are treated with hospitality and kindness and generosity. I hope that when you get home, you'll tell people that we're trying to do that too. It's a very, it's very, it's a very defensive comment, but it's a clear indication that on things like looking out for other people, reciprocity, generosity, and hospitality, the standard of civility was not American, it was Native American. And I think there are lots of <clears throat> aspects of, um, and I think that the attraction or the retention of captives is a way of getting at some of those, um, if you like contrasting understandings and, and viewpoints. Okay, let me find the next question. Sorry, I've been responding and making sure everything's on track. Okay, so here's a question from Robert Engelbert. Um, could you talk a bit how ind indigenous peoples pursued different strategies simultaneously as resistance to American expansion and how that affects how we rethink this history? Um, he's thinking a bit about Shawnee migration to Upper Louisiana at the same time that they are playing a key role in the Northwest Confederacy. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I remember years ago um, when I worked at the Center for the History of the American Indian in at the New Library in Chicago, Fred Hoxie <clears throat> was then the director at one point was saying that often what we do in Native American history if you, if you regarded Native Americans, <clears throat> historical figures as, as, as running out onto the field of history wearing a, a football jersey, instead of having their names on the back of their shirts, they'd have their position, right? So they'd be resistant, accommodationist, right? That Indian people who entered American history were, were pinned down by um, a particular position or tactic. And I think <clears throat> what the, this question gets and why I like this question so much is that colonialism, of course, is not a simple thing, right? It's a multi-pronged assault <clears throat> on people's lives and communities and values, all of that kind of thing. And so I think it makes total sense that native responses to colonialism are equally multi-pronged, right? So there's not just one. And so if, if I can wear thin my spokes of a wheel thing, right? If you're a nation exercising foreign policy, you have a central goal, I think. And that central goal is protect your people, protect your homelands, protect your independence and your way of life. But there's multiple ways of doing that resistance going to war being one of them but not <clears throat> not the only one and not always necessarily the best one right? and people can change their positions at different times and different experiences so somebody like black hoof right as a young man without much of his life fights against europeans and then americans and in later life seems to think that the best route for survival of his people is a route that the Americans call accommodation. I would think of it more as an adaption and adjustment and preserve land and space uh, that way. And so very often, if you... Um, so the hub of my wheel in this case has Shawnee at the center, but you could say, <clears throat> name your Indian nation, right? What it really should do is divide up the hub because you have different groups, right? And so it's not unusual 
in 18th century colonial history to see a single Indian nation dealing simultaneously with different colonial powers. So if you're the Choctaws in the lower Mississippi where you're a powerful <clears throat> national confederacy and everyone's courting you, you have Choctaws dealing with the Spaniards, Choctaws dealing with the French, Choctaws later dealing with the Americans. To the outsiders, it looks as if these people are, the word was fickle, because you can't really tell what they're doing. But of course, what they're doing is keeping their options open, courting and cultivating allies <clears throat> that they may need. And as long as you're talking to people, then they're probably not likely going to war with you. Right? And one of the reasons I'm so interested in 18th century Native American diplomacy is this kind of thing. You find people cropping up in Montreal and in Mobile, uh, people in Charleston and Philadelphia, right? playing off different peoples against the, one another. And, and, and so somebody like Blue Jacket or like Little Turtle, these guys who at some point go to war but they're not just unthinking warriors where their response to anything is, is, is to fight. They are sophisticated leaders with variety of, of options. Right? And I think that's an, an important. Some of you may have seen <clears throat> um, a PBS documentary called We Shall Remain. And one of those episodes is about Tecumseh. Um, and I, I think I'm a voiceover somewhere in there. But I remember when that was being made and I, I had lots of respect for how that was done by all of the people involved and all the native producers and native students. But I remember having a bit of a disagreement with Rick Burns who I've worked with since um, because my objection was, so when Tecumseh is talking about his vision of an Indian state, an independent Indian state, that will maintain itself against the United States with ties to the British, right? Why are the Indian guys that he's talking to, why do they respond by yelling and waving their guns and tomahawks, i.e. acting like warriors, right? Or like warlike people. This is a pretty sophisticated geopolitical plan that he's got going on here. Couldn't we portray these people as thinking about it and reflecting on it, which they surely did. Right? And so for all it was, was good, I, that was something that troubled me because it seemed to play on that stereotype that, okay, what do Indians do confronted with something? You know, they lift their weapons, right? Well, yeah, it, when they had to or when that seemed the best option. But I think um, <clears throat> there's a whole lot of other things going on in which native people are pursuing either alternative policies, but sometimes pursuing multiple policies and sometimes doing it at the same time. Because what they're doing is negotiating these incredibly treacherous waters of colonialism that has not only embroiled them but also all of their native nations as well. And that requires some pretty savvy diplomatic moves as well as uh, simply going, going to war. Okay. Um, I've got a question here from our Chief Ben Barnes. Um, so, Another question, segueing off the map conversation, since we have explored how absence of presence on a map is also fundamental to concern, is a fundamental concern to understanding history, then what role did these deliberate omissions play during the ICC period for EWVs, Great Lakes, and Ohio River nations, as well as the Royce maps? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and I, I suspect Chief Barnes knows the answer to that because uh, the Indian Claims Commission, of course, this, the idea here was that 
Um, this would be an opportunity for, for the government, in a sense, to, to kind of close the books on its Indian business, right? By recognizing that <clears throat> um, Indian peoples, Indian tribes had often lost lands, that treaties had been breached, et cetera, et cetera. And the Indian Claim Commission was supposed to, um, I suppose, see those claims justly justly uh, settled. But of course, how do you do that? Well, one of the things, uh, one of the um, criteria was, of course, if you're gonna claim that land has been lost or taken from you unjustly or illegally in breach of treaty, first of all, of course, you have to establish that the land was yours to begin with. And how are you gonna do that? Well, of course, if you're um, governmentally minded, you're gonna look to a map rather than, for instance, let's ask the people, let's like ask the, the people of the, of the community who know that this is the case, right? Um, and there've been cases elsewhere, I, I know in Canada where um, courts have wrestled with, not very successfully, how do you how do you do this if if you say what is the evidence that this land was always yours and the answer is well it's in our songs right anglo court system i think have a difficult time dealing with that much better to say well look we've got a map here that was produced what does that tell us right well, the map tells us what the person who produced the map at the time knew at that time, right? And maybe based on other people's maps. So I think, of course, um, I could sort of attribute this to a more Machiavellian view. Um, I won't do that. But even with the best of intentions, it means the, the process is flawed, right? Because how can you how can you get to that starting point if you're relying on sources that are with the best of intentions are are, are flawed, and I think that's something that's um, pervaded um, Native American history, and it's it's also I think something that remains uh, a an issue of difficulty, shall I say, in um, legal discourse, United States Indian policy, etc. Okay, and we're getting close. I know our goal is to end this about a um, 7.30 central, 8.30, depending on where you're at, or 6.30 if you're on the other side. <laughs> um, so the next question I've got here is from Steve Roach. Could you talk a little bit about the almost complete absence of women in the history of Shawnee and other tribes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the last question is my answer to this question. Right? Um, because I, I in, in my Native American studies program, right, I'm the only non-Native person. Right? Uh, and so I know from my, my Native female colleagues uh, <clears throat> how important this issue is. But of course, if you're, uh, I often call myself just a bread and, I'm just a historian, I'm just a bread and butter historian, right? And so I'm um, looking at historical records produced primarily by whom, by who? white males who are the last people in the world who are likely to understand say 18th century native women right 18th century white males right so they either don't talk about them or if they do talk about them they talk about them in, in ways that are not particularly helpful and so i've often found that what i have to do is read what little there is and then try and rethink it or <clears throat> look at it in a in a in the context of of of, of culture and of and of change right? so 
and this is a big deal in the in the 18th century in the eastern woodlands where there's this whole issue about the the delaware being referred to as women right what did that mean in the language of that diplomacy as it was used originally i think it meant that the Iroquois saying to them you will be you will restrict yourselves to issues of peacemaking because that's something the delawares had done traditionally and that's a role that in which women played a huge role right but of course even in native discourse i think it took on some other connotations that it had in in white society i also think that in addition to white males being not particularly attuned to understanding and seeing what was going on. Um, they are actually also uh, contributing to a shift in influence and position of native women. So, so William Johnson was the British superintendent of Indian affairs north of the Ohio River <clears throat> up until 1774. And he married Mary or Molly Brandt, who was a Mohawk woman and clan mother. He understood the importance of women in Iroquois Haudenosaunee society. And for him, part of that, that marriage was in part, I think, political. It got him into those networks. He understood that how, how that women were significant and mattered. But he also worked to exclude them from negotiations. Um, and that's something that, that's happening. So if you think of, if I, if I present this, simply that um, in say Cherokee society, right, men are responsible for, and I suppose it's largely true in Shawnee society or the Woodland society, men are res primarily responsible for <clears throat> hunting and warfare. That is taking life women are primarily responsible for raising corn and raising, giving birth and raising children. That's giving life. Right? Men do their thing predominantly outside the community, women inside. And that productivity of women gives them tremendous significant influence. Right? It translates into political influence. So I'm reminded, I'm jumping about here, but I'm reminded of an incident in the Lewis and Clark expedition. So, you know, 2,000 miles to the west, Lewis and Clark are coming back from the Pacific. They're talking with, with people in the Plateau region. And Lewis makes an interesting comment. He says, these Indians allow their women to speak in public councils, right? That's all he says. But it's significant, not, I think, for what it tells us so much about those native societies where women could speak or spoke, but about American society where they clearly don't get to speak. Otherwise, Meriwether Lewis would not have thought this not, not worthy of comment. Right? So <clears throat> um, the Brits go into Cherokee country right and they're going to what they're going because they want Cherokee trade or Cherokee assistance in wars against the French you're going to talk to the people responsible for hunting and fighting so you talk to the males so even people who might be predisposed to think that women have minimal influence in these societies, they're actually going to contribute to reducing that influence because now they're an important part of that world and that environment because they're in, they can deliver guns, they can bring trade, alliances, etc. And who do they want to talk to? They want to talk only to the men. And I think that actually um, reinforces and, and, and 
and sort of strengthens that perception among uh, white people um, about the role of Indian women. Makes it very hard to, I think, of all of the things that we we struggle to recover by reading these records that are necessarily limited and distorted. Um, getting a good understanding of of native women is 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 one of the most challenging, um, especially for me as a white guy and, and about as quintessentially white guys you can get, I suppose. Thank you, Dr. Callaway. I appreciate you taking the time to answer questions. We are gonna kind of wrap it up. Um, Natalie has a plan for addressing the rest of the questions. Would you like to? Oh, that you were just gonna keep yes. track of them. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yes, I have the rest of them saved in a Word file that I can send to oh, Colin afterwards. Sorry, my cat's okay. demanding attention. <laughs> No. Um, and I have everybody's email since you all registered, so I can send him information um, for everybody. There's not terribly too many, but about probably twice as many as he answered. <laughs> um, and I'm, and I, so, I, I see a couple here. I've just opened the chat now, which I didn't before because I get distracted. I see a couple of people saying, can you speak up a little? And I'm sorry <laughs> if I wasn't, <clears throat> um, if I wasn't um, clear enough or, 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 or loud enough. Again, yeah. thank you, Dr. Callaway, for doing this. We really appreciate it. Um, it's a great way to start the new year. <laughs> so, woohoo. <laughs> and um, thank you, everyone, for attending tonight. We appreciate